and welcome back. Now you may remember back in video number 44, which feels like an eon ago, but probably was only a couple of weeks for me, um, we described this rain sensor project, uh, which has sort of grown in complexity a little bit. So I thought I'd um, explain it in a lot more detail. Um, now we still have here the uh, rain sensor pad, which um, I mentioned in that video I was going to solder onto a couple of cables, which I have done, and that's going to go on top of the cat run roof so that we knew when it was raining we could bring the cat in. Since then though, there have been a, a couple of minor amendments, not major, but just a couple of little things that uh, came about as part of the implementation. Now we have the Uno still running there and we have our V-in supply here. Um, this little module here is what controls that rain sensor thingy over there and gives out a voltage 10, 0 to 1023 and um, a digital output as well. Although, frankly, if you knew what the analog voltage is, you could determine your own digital output, couldn't you? But anyway, it gives it to you as an option, so I've used it. Uh, that's the actual 433 transmitter there. Uh, what else? Ah, yes. Well, First of all, there's the DHT11 sensor here, which is the humidity and temperature. That worked fine, and we used that in the previous video just to prove it was working. But now you see, I've given the game away. You can see on the top there, there's a little pizza electric buzzer, as there is, in fact, this, well, I suppose you call it a burger alarm sensor, because that's exactly what it is. Came out of an old burger alarm from years ago. I just kept the bits. You never know when things are, these things are going to be useful, do you? It's all right, the wife's saying, oh, you're collecting all these bits. But here we are, proof of the pudding, you see. It's, it's worthwhile keeping. Now, why have I got this? Well, let's, let's turn it on and look at the debugging window and see what's coming out. That bit right at the back there, there, where I'm pointing with this thing, that's um, an Arduino with the receiver, um, the original receiver. It's stuck down my blue tack. I'm not going to move it. Uh, there we are, look. Let's use technology and move around. So that's the uh, receiver. Nothing's changed there. It's just a very simple go and get me the data and uh, display what you find. Uh, now, I'm going to run this not with a USB cable, which I could do by plugging it in here, but as it would be run outside. So I've got a, a 9 volt supply here. And I don't know whether I'm going to run on 9 or 12 yet. 9 probably, because I've I fixed that 9 volt supply, didn't I, a while ago. So it's there ready to be used. Right, so let's bring up the debug window and just see what comes out of that Arduino at the back when this one starts transmitting. So debug window up. Okay, now the stuff in here um, is going to be from that Arduino at the back, which is on COM port 5. So let me just um, bring that, connect that up. Otherwise, we're not going to have anything to see. It's interesting, actually. The little pop-up that's come up on my screen now, you can't see here. Look, there's a little pop-up here. It's funny, isn't it? That's what this um, OBS broadcasting software does. Anyway, there we are. Look, I'm connected to COM4, so we're waiting for something to happen. So let's plug this in and see what does happen. Beep, beep. And is anything being transmitted? That's the question. Apparently not. Right, back again. Um, I realised I hadn't actually plugged in the lid, which is quite important because... Um, this contains the power on indicator and indeed error indicator and the on off status, which is controlled by this little touchpad. Now, if you looked at my fridge alarm video, that wasn't quite, I don't know, what, a month ago now, maybe? Um, I used exactly the same code, I'm pretty sure, um, to control this on and off as well. So um, I rushed down to get that and plug that in. So now what we want to see is, does this actually transmit to that? Arduino, which is at the back there. It's gone off picture now, so I've reframed everything. But, uh, okay, let's bring up the um, debug window first. So that's there. And let's plug it in and see what we get. Okay. Beep, beep. Oh, and straight away, look, you saw something come out there. But there it goes, look. Um, now, I can make that a little bit bigger for you. It will flood this main window, but... There we are. So that's transmitting now about once every two seconds. Um, and just quickly to go through it, we'll go through it in more detail when we go through the individual uh, lines of code. R means the rain sensor. That's 1023 at the moment. Now, I said it was between 0 and 1023. So if I touch it, even with sort of moderately dry hands, 
I would expect that to change. There we are, look, 918. And if I lick my thumb and then put it on, I expect it to go down significantly lower. There we are, look, 366. Because in the real world, that means you've actually got some kind of rain on there. Okay, now the next one along is the uh, C, that's centigrade. Let's see if I can get this a little bit bigger still, shall we? There we are. Right, it's even better to see now, isn't it? So the next one along is um, centigrade. So that's C28, that's what's um, on this little blue sensor here, the DHT11. The next one is the D, that's the digital rain. Now, that is set by that little blue pot in here. So when it reaches a certain threshold between that 0 and 1023, it, it sets the digital pin high. Fine. Um, H is humidity, so it says 42 at the minute. Now what I'm going to do is just blow on it so that um, you can see the difference. So hang on a minute, this is going to be awkward. But 45, there we are, look. It did work, sort of. So 45 and what else? The uh, K... That is the darkness level, so there's a, a little LED, um, LCD here on the side. So if I cover it up, that K value should change. And there it has, it's gone very high now. So in total darkness, that would also be about 1023. And I'm using that to determine when to uh, not take any action. On the receiving side, not the transmitter. The transmitter keeps going day or night. It's the receiver that's going to make all those decisions. Okay, and finally, the E00, they're my error bits, if you like, or bytes, perhaps in this case. Um, if that DHT11 cannot transmit, or there's a timeout, or something like that, it just can't get the value, then uh, one of these values goes high. One's for timeout, and one's for error, un unspecified error. So that's the data we're transmitting. Um, I've yet to de design the actual receiver, what it's going to do with all this. Um, and in some ways, I think it's good to treat this as a black box and uh, do all the business work at the receiver end because it's easier to adjust the receiver, isn't it, than the transmitter. This could be, as I say, buried in a, a beehive, for example, down the bottom of your garden. I know I use that example a lot, but it gives the example that A, it's one down the bottom of your garden where you don't want to troop. Um, B, it's in a beehive, which is an unfriendly place to go. So really, when you've installed something like this, even in my cat run, I don't really want to be trooping out there day and night fiddling about with the code. So I'll just treat that as a black box, have it transmit the data, and then I'll do something with that. Now the uh, the touch sensor on the front, now these are very bright LEDs. And you might have spotted there on the back, look, I've got a blue one with um, a forward voltage drop of 2.9 volts, and it needs five milliamps to give that brightness. And the green one, 2.4 volts uh, forward voltage drop, and it needs two milliamps, fancy that. Um, so, with a little bit of maths, which funnily enough I did do down in the garage, here it is. Let's just take that debugging off. So what we're saying is the green is 5 minus 2.4, so 5 volts we're supplying, 2.4 voltage drop, this is 2.6 and I want 2 milliamps. So that's 1.3k, well I've stuffed a 1.2 in, that works fine. And for the blue, 5 volts minus 2.9, this is 2.1, um, and I want 5 milliamps, so that's 420 ohms. Um, now, in an E24, E12 series resistor, that's all the, the standard values, um, nothing comes close to that. There's a 390, that was too low, so I've chosen a 470. And as you can see from this, the uh, blue is plenty bright enough. Now, you can only see sort of a white LED with a fringe and a green LED with a fringe, but take it from me, these are ear and um, eye searingly bright. Possibly ear-searingly bright as well, but mainly for your eyes. They are exceptionally bright. And there's the little touch switch working as well. And that stops the just the output running, really. That's all it does. So, um, now, I had it more or less in this state. And then the primary user, yes, my wife, says, hang on a minute. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. Benny's outside. I quickly rush to bring him in because I want to go into town. And I forget to turn this off. And then Benny is going to be subjected to all sorts of bleeps, blurps, and possibly recording saying, it's raining, bring me in, it's raining, bring me in, or worse to that effect, which, yeah, could be a problem. So what we've decided to do is add this, this burglar alarm sensor here on the door, so that as the door closes and opens, you get that little bleep. 
okay which is a, no more than a reminder so as the door closes you get a, a bleep and as you as you go out again you get another bleep simply to say have you turned it on or off as appropriate on here okay so that's that's a fairly simplistic little project really uh, and i'm actually going to install this now uh, because it's taken far more days than i thought simply because life gets in the way doesn't it of your plans so what was probably half a day's project has taken me about four days so far just to grab enough time to do it um, this this sensor pad the rain sensor pad i'm hoping that it's going to survive the test of time um, as i said i've i've soldered on the wires here and put some cling um shrink uh, f tubing on it just to protect the joints really but i mean i've no, no qualms on that obviously the capillary action of rain will probably suck it up there i'm going to install it at 45 degrees i like that so that it will run off and um I've fed these wires in through these mounting holes at the top just to give a bit of strain relief so we're not pulling on the real ones and I'll be screwing it into the little board I'm going to put it on through the bottom here. So that's going to be on top of the roof somewhere in the middle to sense the rain and this is going to go inside. Um, now we do have various holes obviously there's um, a hole here for the power, there's one there for the sensor, there's one grommet hole here for the, uh, the touch pad and the door sensor but I don't think I'm going to seal any of those. This is going to be dry enough and I think it will be okay. I'll be all dry inside. So thumbs up. Great. So I'm going to install that and then I'm going to show you the sequences I went to build it. I've got loads of photos and I'll talk them through. And of course, there's the code. Joy. Now, the code for this, I've made as interesting as I could. For example, I'm actually using pointers in one little bit of it. I didn't have to. I could have used global variables, as you could, if you think, no, pointers aren't for me. They're just a step too far. Fine. Change them to global variables. It worked just as well. But I thought it'd be an ideal opportunity to show you how it works in the simplest way I could. Um, it's got an interrupt now. It didn't have previously, but this door sensor is on, the, on an interrupt because when the door opens and closes, you want an instant bleep, don't you? Not some kind of delay, or you might miss it altogether. So that is on an interrupt, which is why it works so quickly. And it's slightly different from the fridge alarm interrupt routine that I use because this detects a change in state. So low or high, it bleeps on both. Whereas the fridge alarm one only bleeped when it was on close. So when the switch went low. Okay, right, enough bleeping and blurping. I'm going to install all this and then we'll talk about the uh, code. And of course, we've got to think about the receiver. What's it going to do with all this? I don't know. Well, that's the joy of Arduino world, isn't it, really? Right, see you in a bit when this is installed. I'll give you a couple of pictures when I'm out there. So here's the collection of components that I've now got. So it's the, um, oh yes, uh, not a DS18B20. This is in fact a, uh, well, a humidity and temperature regulator. It's the standard DHT11. Um, I've had this lying around in my box for absolutely years, and I think it's about time I used it. So there's that, there's the um, transmitter, well not the transmitter, the module that goes with the uh, brain pad. Um, there's a bit of strip board here that's cut to fit this box which I just have to have lying about. It's a waterproof box but well frankly I don't think it needs to be absolutely waterproof. Sealed yes in some way but waterproof no but it just happens to be that way. Um, there's the Nano. There's an, an LDR here, light dependent resistor because um, I thought well if somebody forgets to switch this off we certainly don't want it telling us it's raining at two o'clock in the morning. Thank you very much. Um, so that's going to be like a fail safe. Um, what else? There's a couple of LEDs here. Now these are very bright LEDs, only tiny little three millimeter ones. But I used one on the uh, fridge alarm project and uh, it only takes like um, two milliamps. It's really, really bright. So uh, that's going to be used. Um, so what else? Well, the other thing I need on here somewhere is going to be a touch pad to turn the, the thing on and off. Uh, and what else? Uh, well, as you can see, because I've now got humidity and temperature sensor, I'll be transmitting three things. So one will be the rain, there or not, you know, presence of rain, and the other two will be temperature and humidity. And the way I'm approaching this now is to think, right, the transmitter is really a black box. It's just going to transmit all the raw data 
every I oh know second let's say in a single loop no interrupts required for this transmit the data every second so temperature humidity and whether there's rain present or not or how much rain in that 0 to 1023 range and let the receiver do all the clever bit which I haven't even worked out yet because I don't care not at this stage I understand in principle what it's going to do as we discussed in the previous video but the actual detail well let's get this transmitter bit working first we can test that we're receiving the data okay with our breadboard receiver that um, we used last time but first of all I'm going to solder all this together and get this thing working so that I can actually put it outside plug it in and then I can do all the rest of the work inside the house at my um, workbench uh, until I get it right so there you are that's what I'm going to do I mean, it's not, it's not going to be that difficult. There's not a lot of stuff here to solder, but as we know, this is the bit that takes the time. So I suspect this is going to take um, two or three hours to get right. Okay, right. I'll show you some more when it's been put together. So here's the project box with a couple of holes drilled out with the LDR and the uh, temperature sensor. Um, here's a different view for it, just so you can see how they uh, fit nice and snugly. And... Oh, get another view look on its side. That quite, looks quite nice, actually. Right, these are the LEDs. Poke through three millimeter holes on the front. Very smart. Um, on the back, I've just soldered them at this minute. It's not quite complete yet. Now, there's the touch pad that I've got as a disc pad, disc thing for a collar. More on that later. Now, this is the completed circuit board with that transmitter area. Oh, look at that. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And there's the uh, completed box. So that fits into that box rather nicely. A couple of holes drilled. Ah yes, the blue and green LEDs held in with a bit of sol um, glue on the front and the rain sensor touchpad thing, capacitive touchpad really. And that's a complete project. There it is, all ready to go. Right, this is what it looks like now. We have a nano in the middle, of course, a couple of LEDs for power and stuff like that. They're the blue and uh, green ones. There's the transmitter, 433 megahertz. Um, let me think, we need a humidity and temperature sensor. I think those are the symbols. Uh, now then we need a pizza speaker so we have that little bleeping sound and the controller for the rain sensor itself so that's the controller and that's the rain sensor itself oh yes there's Benny's thing that's the touchpad and a door magnet switch read relay basically and an LDR for the uh, darkness let's label those up that's the humidity and temperature sensor combined one, the pizza, that's it, controller, fine, that's it, we're all done, super. Okay, let's have a look at the code then. Now the code is necessarily somewhat lengthy because it's got a lot of things to do, but they're all fairly standard methodical things. So I'm not going to cover every single bit, but I would encourage you to download it so you can inspect it at your leisure. I'll just cover the bits that are different to what I've um, ever done before in any one of my other videos so that you can make your own mind up. Okay, so at the top, um, the capacitive sensor we used out in the fridge alarms, I'm not going to go through that again, but it does allow you to have a very stable capacitive touch sensor, one wire, that's all it requires, with a single resistor and a capacitor. So uh, watch my fridge alarm if you want to know how to use that. Now virtual wire, we haven't used that before. That's the thing that actually allows us to uh, serialize the data and send it out using those um, 433 megahertz transmitter receiver pairs. And of course there's the DHT11 uh, library for the, well, the DHT11 uh, sensor. The uh, It's the humidity and temperature combined. Okay, so let's just whiz through all this then. Um, these are all pin assignments, which I'm not going to talk about. I'm sure you can work out what a define does. Um, now this one here, we've got down to the door switch pin area. So the, as soon as you see a, a volatile like this, you, sh you should be thinking, uh-huh, there's an interrupt service routine, an ISR somewhere here, because that's what you, why you need a volatile. What does volatile mean? Well, we covered this again in the uh, fridge alarm video, but it means basically, even if the Arduino happens to have this value, the door is open Boolean value, in a register, uh, or some other place other than its original memory place, even if it has, you're saying, don't trust that, it's volatile, go and fetch it again from memory, so we get the absolute latest version of that. Okay, um, what else have we got? Right, there's the DHT11 object being created here, it's a static object, funnily enough, I don't know why, I haven't looked into this library, I just wanted the thing working. Remember, we were going to use in the original design a DS18B20 sensor, which I've used before, I believe, or at least I've done a video on it. Oh yes, that's right, we have, because then we used two in in uh, parallel, and they work just fine. But um, 
I found this DHT11 sensor that I had in my toolbox for a long, long time. So I thought, right, let's let's use it here and just get rid of the damn thing. So that's what I've done. Uh, right, now here, this bit here, we're looking at a struct. What's a struct? Well, as its name implies, it's a structure. You're saying, I'm creating a structure called weather data, with a capital W, and in it, it's made up of various integers and also some booleans here. Now, if you're thinking, why aren't these on a new line? Well, that's just my IDE here. It's forcing this on the same line. I've no idea why. I've moved them down onto a new line, and as soon as I reformat the code, it puts them all back on the same line. So uh, anyway, so this is a structure, and it's just a way of encapsulating some data, so you know, related data together, and at the same time, we're creating an object here, weather data, from this. So it's a bit like saying struct, weather data, weather data with a small w. You can use any name here, of course, but it's always useful to keep it related. Um, what else have we got? Well, we got this here, this um, sort of generic debug print window. Now, you can, of course, in your code, put serial.println and serial.prints all over the place. But what happens then when you want to switch them off? When you finish your program, and you think that's it, you shouldn't really leave the serial.prints in there because it really, really, really slows down your program, especially if you have only got like a 9600 board rate, which is what I tend to use, uh, just for, for, well, for stability, if nothing else. So you really want to be able to switch it off, really, so you don't keep sending stuff up the serial line that nobody's listening to in your finished project, after all. So by having a routine like this, you can say, if that is debug flag is on, do the serial print. Otherwise, don't. Just do nothing. It comes straight back out and does nothing at all. So this whole little method here allows you to do that. But remember, when you do a debug print of the type serial.print line, whatever, serial.print line has several overloads, as they're called, which means different versions of the same method. And one takes an integer, one takes a long, one takes a string, and the compiler works out which one you need. Well, you can't then therefore make a generic uh, debug print unless you know what type it is. Is it an integer? Is it a long? Is it a string? Is it a float? And so on. So by doing this little construct here, you're saying the type name of T I'm putting in here, and that will tell me what type it is. Then the compiler can figure out what you need here. It's just, um, I don't know, it's just a convenient way of doing it, really. Okay. Right, so we have our setup now. Okay, what's in here? These are all pin assignments. That's the auto calibration service. We're recalibrating every 10 seconds. Once again, we've covered this in the fridge alarm. Basically, it means every 10 seconds, the sensor, which could be drifting by now with a bit of noise or something, is reset to whatever the, the current value of the capacitance is. So that it always is nice and stable. And that works well. The virtual wire, when we're uh, transmitting and using those 433 megahertz transmitter receiver pairs, we have to invert the data. So that's what we're doing here. I'm using 2000 bits per second just for stability. You can use much higher, but your range will become much lower as well because it needs a stronger signal the higher the board rate and the tiniest, tiniest discrepancy will cause it to fail. Now, my cat runs only about 20 feet away from my house. so. I probably couldn't go higher, but I'm not going to. I want stability over all things. So that's uh, 2000, and there's the pin we're transmitting on. There's the uh, the front panel assignments. Uh, here's the interrupt then. So I'm going to say attach an interrupt to the, my door pin. That's the interrupt it, service routine it's going to run. And with this time, we want to do it on a change. So that means if it's low moving to high or high moving to low, that is the door being shut initially and then opening, or was open and now shut, the get door state will trigger at that point regardless. So it will bleep on opening and it will bleep on shutting again. That's the whole point. Okay, now this is the main loop. Um, this simply detects if we've had an error, and if there is an error, it will flash the green light on the front by reading. If you know, this is a, a little construct you can use yourself. If you read, um, the state of a pin, as I've done here, digital read, green LED. You can then say, make the same pin not that value. So if this is high, not high is low. And if it was low, it makes it not low, which is high. It just flips it, toggle, basically. Now this active, it means have I touched the front panel um, cat shape to turn this on? And if it is on, then we do all this stuff here. Now, this is all pretty standard stuff. Um, oh, yes, I have used pointers here a little bit. I mean, at the very sort of fringes, really. What I'm saying is 
go and run my detect rain routine, pass in a reference to this and to this. Now you might say, where is this again? Well, if we go back to our struct, which we would have defined here, but we've already defined it way, way back up here. Look, there we have it. There's our struct. So we can say weather data dot one of these items. Let's scroll back down again to our loop. And we say weather data dot rain analog, that's what the A stands for, and the weather data dot rain digital D. And the ampersand is a reference to that. So we're not passing a value, we're passing the actual reference to where that lives in memory. So if we go down to detect rain, which is a routine I have way down here somewhere, way, way down here. Let's have a look. There it is, detect rain. And we're saying we're passing in two parameters, but these are pointers now to actual memory addresses. OK, so these aren't global variables. These are addresses that are being passed in here. And the whole point of all this is so we can update these values. OK, we are, after all, look, setting them here with the values we're reading from the pins. OK, so that's what that allows you to do. Now, if you think, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm lost, I don't quite understand. Well, the obvious thing to do is use global variables. So instead of using a pointer here and passing in a reference to these, whether data dot rain A and whether data dot rain D, simply use global variables. And that works as well, but I guess it's not best practice, but frankly, for a, a home project, it's absolutely fine. So that's sort of a little tiny flavor of what pointers can do. There's a whole lot more, but that will do for now. So let's go back up to our main loop. Right, so we've detected the rain. Now, after everything, we check if the door's open. Now, as we said, the interrupt routine is gonna check the door and set a flag. And this is the flag it's setting, door open. So if it's true, it will do the bleep and the bleep will set it off again. So then we do the water data, uh, water data, what am I talking about? Weather data dot dark level, the darkness, it reads that from the LDR. And once again then says, if the door is open, go and do the bleep. Then we check the humidity. And once again, we're using references here, look, ampersand to our little struct. Just makes things a little tiny bit neater and self-contained. You might not think so, you might think it's a step too far, fine. Use them, um, global variables, they'll work just as well. So we're checking the data. OK, and then, then we're doing all this here, which is much the same. It just does it in a big, long sequence. Now, all that takes about a quarter of a second. And we don't want this loop to run four times a second. We, in fact, we want to run it once every two seconds. So we then do a little delay. We wait for a delay plus the quarter of a second that we think this takes. And if we're not in debug mode, and as I said, debug takes us a significant amount of time. That is the serial dot prints take a significant amount of time. So if it's not in debug mode, we've saved all that time. Well, I don't want the loop to run any faster. So we simply wait for half a second. Well, I say wait, the do delay ensures we wait. But even when in this do delay, we'll be checking for that door open again. Sort of almost mm, getting towards a, a state machine, not really, but it's sort of working towards that, okay? Uh, and if it's not debug, uh, or rather if it is debug, then we just check the door open and that's it, that's the end of our loop. So that loop with all these delays in at the end runs once every two seconds. Or thereabouts anyway. So what else can I tell you? Well, the actual methods that we've got underneath, this one takes a struct, for example. This is why I'm saying how much easier it is to pass this in than the individual values that make up that structure. Otherwise, this would have you know, five or six parameters coming in. This way, we can just send it a whole bunch of stuff all in one go. And it makes your code cleaner and easier to find. OK, so we have a couple of buffers here. That's the transmit buffer that we eventually transmit. That's the data buffer for each of the variables that we then go and uh, find the value of and concatenate with this big transmit buffer. Remember, we're transmitting this all as one big long string. Now, I can actually show you what we transmit by showing the Arduino um, debug window. There we are. Now, this is the Arduino serial monitor. And you can see this value here, this, this big long string, this one. Now, that's what we're transmitting. We're transmitting R plus the value, that's the rain sensor, capacitive. Then C, which is the Celsius, 25. 
Then the D, digital rain, one or zero. Is it raining or is it not? Humidity, which is 37%. K, which is darkness. K for darkness, 138. Um, just so you know, darkness on a really bright sunshine day, that goes down to about 60. And at night, it goes to, down to about 1,000. So it never goes to zero and it never goes to 1023. But that's enough to fi figure out you know, if it's too dark to do anything. So that's what we're transmitting. And then the receiver, which I'm not talking about in this video, you can see I've split that out to various values. And I'm just running this on my PC day and night. And I've done that for the past, what, 48 hours now? And it's been absolutely fine. So that's what we're constructing here in this little uh, loop. Well, not a loop, this is a method. We're just putting in these strings into the buffer, then getting the data into the data buffer and concatenating that uh, into the transmit buffer. I to A means integer to alpha, so basically integer to string. And then the string uh, that we've just created in the data buffer, we're going to concatenate, join that to the existing TX buffer, and therefore build up step by step that string here that I've just shown you. Okay. Right, what else is there on there? Um, okay, this is the debug bit which we look at on the debug window if it were connected, which it's not because it's now in my cat run. But this just displays what would be transmitted. And of course, I've switched off the debug on the transmitter now, so it's not debugging anything, just transmitting. And then we send the stuff out. This is how you send it out. And you wait until the transmission is completed. That's it, really. You'll probably find examples of this all over the internet. Um, it's not I don't know, it's not the friendliest of... Um, ways of doing stuff but it works beautifully and is um, is nice to use in that sense that it is a stable library but it has now been replaced would you believe by something else never mind all good things come to an end right so there's various other little um, methods here that to go and get the values basically go and get this value go and get that value and the ISR the door state is right down the bottom here look this first line basically says if I've been here less than 250 milliseconds ago don't bother doing anything that's just switch bounce because even a read relay will give you switch bounce so just ignore it now if it's been a quarter of a second or more that's fine then change the door state from open to close close to open whatever just just change it okay so that's really a very high level look at the code. I'd, I'd encourage you just to download this and read it and see if you can understand it. If you, have, if you find bits on it you think oh, I don't understand what this is doing post a, a question on the, um, the video page and I'll um, attempt to explain exactly how that works. But if I went into any more detail now this whole video would be an hour and a half not just the half hour it normally is. Okay that's that. Let me um, go back to the main video recording. So here it is actually installed. There's a little box screwed onto the framework. And you say the, those LEDs, they are really bright, aren't they? Now the power supply is over here. So it needed quite a long cable. It's just a nine volt and runs straight across. Now there's the sensors on the side and at the top of the door, there's those burger alarm reed switch and magnet pair. There we are, look. So open and close, open and close. That's the ISR working on the change event. And of course the touch switch, on and on again. It's quite quick, look, as soon as I touch it, it, it responds. So that's pretty good. Now if we go outside, now look, here you can see how big this cat run is. We call it the elephant run. Anyway, enough of that. On top of the roof there, there's the little uh, sensor on a piece of offcut. Actually, it's just a rough old bit of wood I had. But at 45 degrees, as you can see there. So there we are, that's it, all done and dusted. Right, and that brings us to the end of the transmitter project. Now, of course, I'm playing about with this thing here, which is the receiver end. And all I've done so far, as you saw in a very quick, tiny glance in this video, that this is actually receiving the data and splitting the received data up and um, just displaying it on the serial monitor, really. So um, that's as far as I've got with this. I really have got to start putting my thinking cap on this. So it probably won't be the next video, probably. Who can tell? Um, but do keep tuned because obviously I've got to make the receiver part of it now to make this project worthwhile. But at least I know that uh, the transmitter part is working nicely. Okay, well I hope you enjoyed that and found it useful. And there were some things in there, especially the code that you might have thought, hmm, that's a useful technique. And uh, yeah, it's all working well. I'm sure Benny will be really impressed when we get his stuff in 
uh, without it getting wet. That's when I've built this one, of course. Okay, that's it. Thanks for watching. Give me a thumbs up, share, all the rest of the stuff. See you later. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. Please leave comments down below. Subscribe, share, and give me a thumbs up. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.